Hello, my dear students and the rest of the learners. Welcome to this presentation in which we are going to discuss on the topic memory management in operating systems, with this being part five of a nine series of videos on this topic. In this topic, we are going to discuss the use of visual memories in as far as memory management using operating systems is concerned. My name is Meme JM, or you can simply call me Emily Swap. In this discussion, we are going to look at the basic concepts of visual memory in terms of introduction, the importance and the purpose of visual memory. Then we shall look at visual address space, memory management unit, mapping of physical to visual addresses, methods of translating addresses, and finally, we shall look at the advantages and disadvantages of visual memory. While memory sizes are increasing rapidly, software sizes are increasing much faster. Also, the trend towards multimedia puts even more demands on memory. As a consequence of these developments, there is a need to run the programs that are too large to fit in memory, and there is certainly a need to have systems that can support multiple programs running simultaneously, each of which fits in memory, but which collectively exit memory. A solution adopted in the 1960s was to split the programs into literal pieces that we call overlays. Overlays are pieces of a program that is too big to fit in the available memory so as to enable it to be executed. Therefore, when a program was started, all that was loaded into memory was the overlay manager, which immediately loaded and ran overlay zero. When it was done, it would tell the overlay manager to load overlay one either above overlay zero in memory if there was a space for it or on top of overlay zero if there was no space. Some overlay systems were highly complex, allowing many overlays in memory at once. The overlays were kept on the disk and swapped in and out of memory dynamically by the overlay manager. Although the actual work of swapping overlays in and out was done by the operating system, the work of splitting the program into pieces had to be done manually by the programmer. Splitting large programs up into small modular pieces was time consuming, boring, and error prone. Therefore, few programmers were good at this. Virtual memory was thus developed to solve this problem of using overlays so as to turn the whole job over to the computer. Virtual memory is a storage location scheme in which secondary memory is addressed as though it were part of main memory by enabling us to map a logical address space onto a smaller a physical memory, thus allowing the execution of process that may not be completely in memory. This facility allows programs to address memory from a logical point of view without regard to the amount of main memory physically available. Virtual memory can also be seen to be a space in a secondary storage medium such as hard disk that is set up to emulate the computer's random access memory in which large programs can store themselves in formal pages while their execution 
and only the required portions of processes are loaded into the main memory. With this extra memory, a computer is able to address more memory than the amount physically installed on the system, making this technique to be very useful as large virtual memory is provided for user programs when a very small physical memory is available. The executive component that manages the virtual address space, the physical memory allocation, and the paging is the virtual memory manager. The design of the virtual memory manager assumes that the underlying hardware supports virtual to physical mapping. A paging mechanism and a transparent cache coherence on multiprocessor systems as well as allowing multiple page table entries to map to the same physical page frame. The size of virtual storage is limited by the addressing scheme of the computer system and by the amount of secondary memory available and not by the actual number of main storage locations. Virtual memory systems separate the memory addresses used by a process from the actual physical address, thus increasing the size of the virtual address space behind the available amount of RAM using paging or swapping to secondary storage. Therefore, the quality of the virtual memory manager can have an extensive effect on overall system performance. What the virtual memory fundamentally does is create a new abstraction the address space, which is an abstraction of physical memory, just as a process is an abstraction of the physical processor, that is the central processing unit. Virtual memory can be implemented by breaking the virtual address space up into pages and mapping each one onto some page frame of physical memory or having it temporarily unmapped. The set of addresses that are program generated are seen by a program during execution and are assigned to a location in the virtual memory to allow that location to be accessed as though it were part of many memory are known as virtual addresses and they form the virtual address space. An address space is the range of all memory addresses that are available to a process. They may either be logical or physical addresses. A logical address is an address generated by the central processing unit that is used by each process to reference its memory location independent of the current assignment of data to memory. Therefore, the set of all logical addresses that are generated by a program form its logical address space. The virtual address space of a process refers to the logical or visual view of how a process is stored in memory. Typically, this view is that a process begins at a certain logical address, say at the zero, and exists in contiguous memory. Virtual address spaces that include hosts are known as sparse address spaces. Using a sparse address space is beneficial because the holes can be filled as the stack or heap segments grow, or if we wish to dynamically link libraries or possibly other shared objects during program execution. A physical address space is the address understood by the computer hardware and is the memory that is seen by the memory unit. It is thus the absolute address loaded into memory address register for the actual location in main memory, and it is used to retrieve the contents from the memory. Therefore, the set of all physical addresses corresponding to these logical addresses is a physical address space. With the virtual addressing, the central processing unit accesses main memory by generating a virtual address, which is converted to the appropriate physical address before being sent to the memory. This is illustrated 
in the following diagram for a system that uses virtual addressing. From this diagram, it is very clear that the memory management unit is found under the same or in the same central processing unit chip with the central processing unit. And therefore, the central processing unit generates a virtual address for a memory location that contains um, information that has to be accessed. But this information cannot be able to be accessed from the physical memory, for example, the RAM, without or before that virtual address is translated into a physical address. For that reason, when the central processing unit generates a virtual address for the data that it is looking for, that virtual address is sent or received by the memory management unit, which is MMU, that translates that virtual address into a physical address, which is then sent to the main memory and the required data or section of that memory that contains the data is accessed and that data is therefore submitted to the arithmetic and logic unit, which is part of the central processing unit as a data want. And that is why there is this arrow or there's an arrow running from the main memory labeled data want that is forwarded to the central processing unit. So that arrow from the main memory to the central processing unit indicates the direction through which the data or information that has been accessed from the main memory flow to the central processing unit. A logical address must therefore be translated to a physical address, just as I have said, before the memory access can be achieved. The task of converting a virtual or logical address to a physical address is known as address translation. This task of address translation is carried out by an dedicated hardware on the central processing unit chip called the memory management unit or MMU using a lookup table that is stored in main memory whose contents are managed by the operating system. During the course of execution of the process, relative addresses are encountered. These include the contents of the instruction register, the instruction addresses that occur in branch and the call instructions, and data addresses that occur in load and store instructions. Relative address is thus a particular example of a logical address in which the address is expressed as a location relative to some known point in the program, usually the beginning of the program. The following diagram, therefore, is similar to the one we have looked into or at, but this one now has a disk controller and it also indicates a bus, which is an electronic pathway through which data, instructions, or information flow from the central processing unit to memory and from memory to the central processing unit, as well as to the other various parts of the computer. And therefore, just as we have seen in the other diagram, the central processing unit package contains the central processing unit and the memory management unit. The central processing unit will generate a virtual address and send it to the memory management unit. Then the memory management unit will send or will convert that virtual address to a physical address that it will then send to the memory. In addition, the virtual address generated by the central processing unit may also refer to the data that is stored in a certain auxiliary storage or secondary storage device. And therefore, that address will have to be submitted to a disk controller that will then be in charge of accessing the relevant portion or section or location of information from within a secondary storage device such as a disk. 
When virtual memory is used, the virtual addresses do not go directly to the memory bus, as we have seen. Instead, they go to a memory management unit. The memory management unit maps the virtual addresses onto physical memory addresses. The memory management unit is therefore also called the memory mapping hardware. The memory management unit's job is simply to translate virtual addresses into physical addresses, just as you can see from the following diagram. So from this diagram, we have the virtual address. Then we have the physical address, which can be a representative of the main memory. And we also have secondary storage, a medium with a secondary memory. And therefore, if the virtual address, for example, address A, refers to a physical address in the RAM, which we are calling A also, then the virtual address generated will be translated into a physical address A that will then be used to access the data or the content of the physical address um, from the memory. And therefore, the virtual addresses match directly with the physical addresses. The only difference is that the virtual address, as we are going to see, contains what we call a page, especially when we shall be discussing on the paging, that is in our next video, part six, we are going to see that virtual address contains a page while a physical address contains a frame. And therefore, there's a direct correlation or match between virtual addresses and the physical addresses, as well as virtual addresses may also have a relation with a memory in a secondary storage device. So the virtual addresses can refer to addresses that are found in a physical medium like RAM, and it can also refer to the contents or memory of a secondary storage media, what we call the secondary memory. In the memory management unit hardware, a present and absent bit keeps track of whether a page is mapped or not. If a program tries to use an unmapped page, the memory management unit notices that the page is unmapped and it causes the central processing unit to trap to the operating system. This trap is called a page fault. And we are going to discuss more on this under paging. The operating system then picks one page frame and writes its contents back to the disk. It then fetches the page just referenced into the page frame just freed changes the map and restarts the trapped instruction. The following diagram therefore illustrates how mapping works, showing the relation between virtual address that a computer can generate and the physical memory addresses that a computer has given by the page table. In this example, we have a computer that can generate 16-bit addresses from zero up to 64. These are virtual addresses. The computer, however, has only a 32 kilobyte of physical memory. And for that reason, a 64 kilobyte program cannot be loaded entirely in memory. It is only a portion of that process or a program that will be loaded into memory. And then later on, that portion that has been acted upon will be removed and another portion will be brought into memory. And we shall discuss this under segmentation video, as well as paging, uh, page memory, paging memory management or memory allocation under my next series of the video. So this is the diagram, my dear students, that we talk about. You can see that the virtual address space um, runs from zero kilobytes all the way to 64 kilobytes. In this case, like zero kilobytes to four kilobytes forms what we call a page or a virtual page. For example, this is a virtual page. This is another virtual page. 
And therefore, we have several pages, which are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So those are 16 visual pages. With each visual page, uh, running from zero to four kilobytes. And then we can see that we have a physical memory, just as we have said, which is of maximum at the two kilobytes. And uh, in the physical memory, we have what we call the page frames. So the zero kilobytes to zero to four kilobytes for virtual page has to match with a certain page frame in the physical memory. Like for example, this diagram, we can see that this visual page um, is referring to the eight kilobyte to 12 kilobyte page frame. So these page frames, the number of page frames here are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is a half of the virtual pages that we have. And for that reason, at any given time, the physical memory address on the page frames will refer to a half of the process. That is a half of the visual um, pages. And then later on, be able to access or accommodate the other a half of the visual pages. A complete copy of a program's core memory image up to 64 kilobytes must be present on the disk so that the pieces can be brought in as needed. And this means that because the visual addresses or the, the, the memory found to by the visual addresses for a program or a program being refunded to by the visual addresses is bigger than the available physical memory, then what will happen is that a portion of the secondary storage medium, like the hand disk, will be treated as a visual memory where the entire program will be kept and then our process will be kept and then it will be broken down into two pieces where the first piece of that two kilobytes will be loaded into RAM. Then after it has completed its execution, it will be removed, be taken back to the virtual memory in a secondary storage or simply the entire 64 kilobytes of a process or a program will have to be broken down into pages where each page is brought into memory at a certain time. And those pages are of equal sizes and their sizes match with their respective page frames in the main memory. So the pages and the page frames are usually exactly the same size. In this example that we have seen, they are of size four kilobytes. Therefore, with a 64 kilobyte of visual address space and that a two kilobytes of physical memory we have 16 visual pages and eight page frames. The transfers between memory and the disk are always in units of a page. And that's exactly what we have seen. You can see that the visual page size is equal to the size of a page frame. Therefore, during the process of mapping or translating visual or logical addresses, on the physical addresses, the visual address is split into a visual page number on the high order bit side and an offset for the lower order bits. The visual page number is then used as an index into the page table to find the entry for that visual page. From the page table entry, the page frame number, if any, is found. The page frame number is attached to the high order end of the offset, replacing the visual page number to form a physical address that can be sent to the memory. For example, with a 16-bit address and a 4-kilobyte page size, the upper four bits could specify one of the 16 visual pages 
and the lower 12 bits will then specify the byte offset 0 to 495 within the selected page. This is illustrated in the following diagram that shows the internal operation of the memory management unit with 16 4 kilobyte pages. So here it is. As you can see, my dear students and the rest of the learners, from this diagram, we have the visual or logical address here at the bottom. That's what we are calling incoming visual address. And if you count them, this this virtual address is composed of 16 bits. That is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And therefore, we are saying that the first four bits, this is the side we are calling the the high order uh, side. So these first four bits here, these first four bits, that is zero, zero, one, zero, represents a visual page. If we translate or convert zero, zero, one, zero to a decimal number, we are going to get digit two. So this two, that we have gotten is used as an index in the page table. And therefore, the memory manager goes to the page table, this is the page table, and goes directly to the index number that we have been able to get from the virtual address. In this case, it will move to index two. And then from there, it will look for the content in this page table under that index. And the binary digit that is there is one, one, zero, with a one absent bit, meaning that this part of the page table has now been accessed. So this one, one, zero is now the frame number, the frame number, the frame for the physical address. And therefore, this 110 will now be used to replace the high order bits for the virtual address that we had so that we can form what we are calling a physical address. And therefore, you can see that the 00 one zero zero one zero has now been replaced with one one zero zero so zero one zero or zero zero one this one has been replaced here with one one zero and then the rest of the bits remain the same the rest of the bits are the same and therefore that's what we are saying that the 12 bits here, these 12 bits, which represent the offset, are copied directly as they are from this virtual address to the physical address. And you can see that these 12 bits are the same as these 12 bits. That's what we call offset. So, so the only part that we change between virtual address and the physical address is the visual page number and or what we are calling the visual page and what we are calling the physical frame or the frame in the logical address. Good. So a range of address, visual addresses is still to be mapped or committed if there is physical memory associated with the range. A mapping is a correspondence between a range of visual addresses and some memory or a memory mapped object. Memory mapping, also known as file mapping, is therefore the technique of making a part of the address space appear to contain an object such as a file or a device 
so that ordinary memory accesses act on that object. The translation between visual and the physical addresses requires information about where in physical memory every visual address is located. This information is called a map. Every process has its own map loaded by the operating system when the process is brought into memory. Usually there are two maps, one for user mode and the other one for the kernel mode. If every virtual address was allowed to map to an arbitrary physical address, the map would need to be at least as big as the primary memory. To reduce the translation information to manageable size, the memory is divided into blocks. All addresses in a block are translated in the same way. The three common translation methods used are number one, paging, in which all blocks are of the same size. In other words, a process or information or data is broken down into blocks of equal sizes, that is paging. For segmentation, the same is broken down into blocks, but of different sizes. And then you have other translation methods that combine both paging and segmentation methods. Virtual address allocation scheme works as follows. If a new process to be brought into memory is larger than the available mini memory, it is first broken up into a number of pages that we call pages or segments. And these pieces need not be contiguously located in main memory during execution. The combination of dynamic runtime address translation and the use of a page or a segment table permits this. The operating system begins by bringing in only one or a few pieces to include the initial program piece and the initial data piece to which those instructions refer. The portion of a at any time is called the resident set of the process. As the process executes, things proceed smoothly as long as all memory references are at locations that are in the resident set. Using the segment or a page table, the processor always is able to determine whether this is so. If the processor encounters a logical address that is not in main memory, it generates an interrupt indicating a memory access fault. The operating system then puts the interrupted process in a blocking state. For the execution of this process to proceed later, the operating system must bring into many memory the piece of the process that contains the logical address that caused the access fault. For this purpose, the operating system issues a disk input output read request. After the input output request has been issued, the operating system can dispatch another process to run while the disk input output is performed. Once the desired piece has been brought into main memory, an input output interrupt is issued, giving control back to the operating systems, which places the affected process back into a ready state. When the operating system brings one piece in, it must draw out another. If it draws out a piece just before it is used, and then that piece is used or is required within a very short time or almost immediately, then too much of this can lead to a condition that we call drashing. Drashing is therefore a situation whereby the program or the system, the system spends most of its time swapping pieces rather than executing instructions. The avoidance of drashing led to a variety of complex but effective algorithms. In essence, the operating system tries to guess based on recent history, which pieces are least likely to be used in the near future. This reasoning is based on belief in the principle of locality. 
This principle states that program and data references within a process tend to cluster. Hence, the assumption that only a few pieces of a process will be needed over a short period of time is valid. Also, it should be possible to make intelligent guesses about which pieces of a process will be needed in the near future, which avoids thrashing. Therefore, is that the combined size of the program data and the stack may exceed the amount of physical memory available for it. And therefore, the operating system keeps those parts of the program currently in use in main memory while the rest of the program or a process are kept on a disk. For example, if you have a 16 megabyte program running on a four megabyte machine, then it means that at every given time or instant, the memory manager will break that 16 MB into four MB uh, pages or pieces, which then will be brought into memory one at a time, while the rest leaves. Once a page is acted upon, it is executed, it is removed, then the next page is brought in, then that one is removed, the next piece is brought in until the entire 16 megabyte program has been executed or attended to as needed. So virtual memory serves two purposes. Number one, it allows us to extend the use of physical memory by using a disk. Number two, it allows us to have memory protection because each virtual address is translated to a physical address. In real scenarios, most processes never need to load fully for the following reasons. Number one, user written error handling routines are used only when an error occurs in the data or computation. Number two, certain options and features of a program may be used rarely. Number three, many tables are assigned a fixed amount of address space, even though only a small amount of the table is actually used. For virtual memory to be practical and effective, two ingredients are needed. Number one, there must be hardware support for the paging and the auto segmentation scheme to be employed. Number two, the operating system must include software for managing the movement of pages and or segments between secondary memory and the main memory. The ability to execute a program that is only partially in memory has the following benefits or advantages of using virtual memory. Number one, it enables users to run processes that are larger than actual physical memory. Number two, it abstracts main memory into a large uniform array of storage, separating logical memory as viewed by the user from physical memory. This arrangement frees programmers from concern over memory storage limitations. Number three, because each user program could take less physical memory, several programs could be run at the same time with a corresponding increase in CPU utilization and the throughput, but with no increase in response time or turnaround time. Number four, it makes the task of programming much easier because the programmer no longer needs to worry about the amount of physical memory available, but he or she can concentrate instead on the problem to be programmed. Number five, a program is no longer constrained by the amount of physical memory that is available. Therefore, large programs than the physical memory can be written as virtual space available is huge compared to physical memory. Number six, less number of input output is needed to load or swap each user program into memory, making each user program to run faster and lead to easy swapping of processes. Number seven, it provides an efficient mechanism for process creation known as copy on write, where in parent and the child processes share actual pages of memory. Number eight, it also allows processes to share files easily and to implement shared memory. 
System libraries can be shared by several processes, the mapping of the shared object into a virtual address space. I repeat, system libraries can be shared by several processes through mapping of the shared object into a virtual address space. Therefore, although each process considers the shared libraries to be part of the virtual address space, the actual pages where the libraries reside in physical memory are shared by all the processes. Typically, a library is mapped read only into the space of each process that is linked with it. It enables processes to share memory by allowing one process to create a region of memory that it can share with another process. Processes sharing this region consider it part of the virtual address space, yet the actual physical pages of memory are shared. However, the following are the main advantages of virtual memory. Number one, it is not easy to implement. I repeat, the following are the main disadvantages, disadvantages or limitations of using virtual memory. Number one, it is not easy to implement. Number two, it may substantially decrease performance if it is used carelessly. Number three, it is the kind of memory that is not dependable because it does not really exist. Number four, some programs may not execute in PCBUS, that is, a whole process or a program need to be loaded for the process to run well and smoothly. So the use of virtual memory and dressing, such as paging or segmentation, means that the kernel can choose what memory each program may use at any given time, allowing the operating system to use the same memory locations for multiple tasks. This gives the kernel discretionary power of where a particular application's memory is stored, or even whether or not it has actually been allocated yet. When the kernel detects a page fault, it will generally adjust the virtual memory range of the program, which triggered it, granting it access to the memory requested. This gives the kernel discretionary power over where a particular application's memory is stored or even whether or not it has actually been allocated yet. So the virtual memory management system maintains a copy of the memory for all programs on secondary storage, such as hard drive, thus allowing the execution of processes that are partially in system memory. This system is commonly implemented through paging and segmentation techniques that we shall look at or into in the subsequent series of the, the nine videos under this topic on memory management. Congratulations for viewing and listening to this video on use of virtual memory, which is part five of memory management topic. You can listen to the other parts of memory management topic as well as other videos in the field of computers or ICT from MLSWAP YouTube channel. In addition, for you to be able to access free life skills, motivational and inspirational resources, visit MLSWAP Motivation YouTube channel. I would also request that you subscribe to both the channels if you have not already done so in order to be able to receive immediate updates whenever a new video is posted. For any further correspondence, kindly write to us through the email mlswap at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening to me and be blessed.